Hi everyone, I'm Amy Johnson Crow. Family letters are so important to genealogists. They give us clues not only about our genealogy and giving, giving us clues on where to look, but it gives us insight into the lives of our ancestors through their own words. And it's important to know how to preserve those letters correctly. Today, I'm talking with Denise Lovnick, who's the author of several books, including How to Archive Family Keepsakes, Learn How to Preserve Family Photos, Memorabilia, and Genealogy Records. Denise, thanks for joining me. Thanks so much. It's nice to see you again, Amy. <laughs> so, a situation that a lot of us will find ourselves in at some point is we're cleaning out our parents' home or our grandparents' home, and we come across the stack of letters. Sometimes it's a nice stack that you find in the desk, or it's in a shoebox, or a, a footlocker, or I've even seen them in Ziploc bags. What do you do when all of a sudden you have this stack of letters? You want to keep them, but where do you even start? Well, that's a good question, because that's exactly how we find them everywhere, don't you think? In drawers, and I found uh, things in suitcases, trunks, and um, I've cleared out quite a few estates by now. I don't know why people just keep dying, you know? <laughs> they, <laughs> I want them to stick around. Yeah, exactly. But we have these estates, and um, we need to, I, you're kind of torn because you know you've got to, clean out the home, but you want to honor their memory. Yeah. So um, if you're the one who's fortunate enough to bring the letters home with you, <clears throat> and let's say they're, they've been in several different places, well, it kind of depends. Sometimes letters can be dispersed throughout a home. They'll be in a drawer, like we said, or maybe a file folder, and then they get all thrown into one box and they come home with you. And if that's the case, the original order has been lost to some extent. And that original order is really important because that tells you how the person who received them perceived and collected and, you know, worked with that little group of items. Mm -hmm. So you want to maintain the original order first off as much as you can. Okay. If you um, received things that were all in one tidy little file folder, keep them together. Um, if you received things that were separate, you need to make some decisions first off. Mm -hmm. And for instance, if you did you inherit some letters yourself? I mean, maybe you did, and they were from several family members. Right. So you need to probably think about, okay, I've got letters here, in my case, I inherited my mother's, my aunt's, my grandmother's things. My grandmother had letters she had written to her own mother. Nice. And when her mother passed away, she brought those letters back. Right? Okay. So, so my grandmother also had letters that my mother wrote to her. So you've got three generations. And in fact, my grandmother had letters I wrote her. Oh, nice. Yeah. So you've got four generations of letters. Now, how are you going to organize these? Chronologically? Mm -hmm. um, you know, then you can watch a conversation unfold. But like in my case, I have probably over a thousand pieces of correspondence. Wow. And I started to work with it chronologically, but it was very difficult mm -hmm. because I wanted to uncover the stories by person, it just to make sense of it, because it's, it's so overwhelming. So now I have tried to work, I've tried to pull, my, my collection, by the way, was in a, it was just in a mess. It had all been tossed in a trunk. So the original order had been lost. Mm -hmm. But I've tried to break it into um, author, the person who wrote those letters. Okay. And, like, for instance... I've been working lately with my great-grandfather's correspondence and his things. So I've got them all in a banker's box. And these are the letters that he wrote, he authored. Very okay. nice. Now, you have to think about this, like, in copyright terms. Mm 
mm -hmm. ownership. I mean, what do you want to do with it? Right. If you want to write a family history, it's unlikely your family members are going to be upset. Maybe they will. I don't know. But if, if it's somebody in a recent generation and you want to use those things, you may need permission from the heirs. Right. So there's so many things to think about. Right. So, so when you have these, in your case, thousands of pieces of correspondence, and yes, I am jealous of that, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a good problem to have. Yeah, come help. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but when you do have these, when you do have so many pieces of, of paper that you're dealing with, now you have them all arranged there in a really nice, looks like a, a, a hinged banker's box. Um, what is, how do we keep those papers safe? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing we should probably take them out of the shoe box. We should probably take them out of the Ziploc baggie. Um, do we need to keep just one letter per folder or how, how can we do that just logistically? Well, let's say you have a collection that's manageable, maybe a few folders worth of letters. Okay. Okay, so I would take one folder at a time because they're arranged in that group. Mm -hmm. And I would sit, I would wash your hands, you know, wash your hands. You don't need to put on gloves. Cover your dining table with an old sheet or your kitchen table and sit down and look at those letters. See what you've got. You need to know what you've got because you can't begin to, to folder them and understand until you see what's there. Kind of look at that one folder and say, oh, okay, this is correspondence from Aunt Jane, and these letters are all to her brother. So kind of understand what you've got. Then put that folder away and look at the next folder. Is it a continuation of that correspondence the next decade, or is it a new person, or what's, what's the deal? Try to figure out why they were separate, if there was even any reason, and then... Um, when you kind of understand what you have, you're going to want to get some archival supplies, which is like this box is um, uh, an acid-free, lignin-free archival box. They're called Hollinger boxes, mm -hmm. and they, they have metal edges. You can kind of see the metal here. Okay. Um, they're heavy board, and... It's interesting that they are engineered so that they protect what's inside from temperature changes and humidity a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, not like a plastic box. Right. But you really want to avoid plastic because it can, moisture can get in, but it won't get out. Good point. I have heard them, plastic boxes can just be like, you know, the kiss of death sometimes. And then inside the box, you'll want to have a file folder that's also acid-free, lignin-free. And because these are a little expensive, mm -hmm. if you have a big collection, I use one of these bigger manila ones to group several other letters. Now, each letter I have placed inside an archival file a paper folder. I'll show you one. And they're, the folders are less expensive because they're, you know, they're just paper. And you can write something on the top. Oh, okay. You begin to organize your letter. So, for instance, this one is, I'm just pulling one out, E.B. Kinzel, my great-grandfather, to his daughter Arlene. And I have, oops, sorry, I have the date. And then inside, I have the, let, uh, the envelope. And each page that was in the envelope. Now, you know, people pass stuff around. So, look, there was more than one letter inside there. So, you But it's all inside this paper folder. And then I've grouped them in these manila folders. It gives them a little more support. Um, then I can work with them like this. Right. So, so that's the first step for me. So, so you, you brought up an interesting point that... In that paper folder, you put everything that you had found in that envelope. Right. So it, so let's say that there was a little birth announcement 
that had been tucked into that envelope or was, was part of the original letter, you wouldn't take out that birth announcement to put that into a separate birth announcement folder um, maybe that, that you have. So, so you're keeping everything that was in that envelope that you found, keeping all of that material together then. Well, this first phase is just what I, the preservation phase. Right. We're not doing research yet here. Right. When we start doing research in this stuff, then I would probably photocopy that item, that birth announcement, mm -hmm. and then either leave the photocopy in the folder and take the original out or the other way around. Right. You know, and make notes about it, what I'm doing with it, and that kind of thing. But at this point... I mean, I don't know where I'll be. If I get hit by a car tomorrow, at least all this stuff is in an archival box, and hopefully my sons won't pitch it. <laughs> at, at, least it at least it's safe, and it's all together yeah. and in some sort, all of, together. Right. some sort of order. In terms of actually storing the material, is it okay to store it, after you put it into the Hollinger box, is it okay to put it back up in the attic, or where should we put that box? Oh, you're a librarian. <laughs> a nice library shelf would be the good pl a good place. Now, I actually have a um, closet that I is my home archive. Mm -hmm. It's an into on an interior wall. There are no pipes, no electrical wiring in that closet or around it. Mm -hmm. I just have a light in the closet, but. I don't have like things going through the wall that are going to cause problems. It's metal shelving that's all coated, um, so I'm not causing any more problems from wood. And you don't want to put your things in an attic or garage, um, uh, basement, because you want to keep that cool but even temperature. Um, 60 degrees would be wonderful, but it's a little cool for most of us. Right. So. 68, 70 is good. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, a nice even humidity, not too hot, not too dry, that right. kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, when, when I was in library school, the rule of thumb was if it's comfortable to on the cool side for you, then that's, that's, that's when paper is happy. <laughs> yes, that is when paper is happy. That's when paper is happy. And we want our paper to be happy. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> So one question that I know that a lot of people are going to be asking, and that is, as you're going through the papers and you're just getting it organized, you're just getting things taken out of the shoe boxes, out of the Ziploc bag, and getting them sorted and into something more archivally sound, how do you handle the temptation of reading everything and stopping and researching everything based on what you're reading. How do you handle that? You mean you, you, you don't just do that? <laughs> I do. <laughs> when, my, when my mom came to visit, I'd say, Mom, what do you want to do today? She said, well, let's read Mama's letters. <laughs> and we'd sit at the dining table, you know, and yeah. we would just read my grandmother's mail. Yeah. It was great. So, I don't know. You, I make a note, I do, mm -hmm. on these little folders. Um, I will, I'll write something right here in the middle. Sometimes I use an archivally not sound uh, sticky note up here mm -hmm. just to mark it for myself. But I know I'm going to go back shortly. And I make a list. Um, I'm starting to use a, um, a collector software program that will allow me to make better notes of things I want to go back to. It's hard. It's hard. But progress is made when you can discipline yourself a little bit. Yeah. 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 When, when I was in, actually when I was an undergrad, I was doing an internship at the Ohio Historical Society. Now it's the Ohio History Connection. And one of my projects was to process this collection of World War II letters. Mm -hmm. And I felt so bad because it took me so long to process it because I kept stopping to read them. And yeah. I said something to my manager one day. And I said, you know, I'm sorry that I'm not getting this done faster because, you know, something will catch my eye and I'll, I'll start to read this letter. She said, Amy, don't worry about it. We all do it. 
<laughs> yeah, it, it's it's hard not to. But but you think as long as you have some sort of you know some sort of way to just jot down some notes as you're reading it, and that way you can maybe have your cake and eat it too. Well, you know it's it's okay to to do that, and you can also um, clip a little index card on the front of the Hollinger box to remind you of what's in there. And I have made notes before of you know, family names that I've noticed in a letter that I want to go back and check that out. And then, oh my gosh, here's a whole connection to enter in my database. But I don't want to stop at this point right. and go down that rabbit hole. Yeah. Um, I want to do what Sally Jacobs, the practical archivist, suggests. Mm -hmm. You know, get box level control. Yeah. I want box level control and then I'll get into it, the folders. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I, I just want to revisit one thing that you said just to just to make sure that, that we're clear. When you were talking about the sticky notes, you're putting the sticky notes on the folder, not on the letter, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. On the folder or even on the outside of the box, right. you know, that kind of thing. Um, you know, I, I should mention that I read uh, sometimes on Facebook, people are posting about a collection of letters and they're so happy to find them. And they put them all into um, plastic sheet protectors mm -hmm. in a binder so that they can enjoy them. And I, I think that is probably better than leaving them in a shoebox. Mm -hmm. But um, you're just kind of changing one problem for another, I think, at that point. Um, your original letter really deserves a little bit more care if it's something valuable like a, a collection of World War II love letters or mm -hmm. wartime letters or something I think you know to invest twenty dollars in the supplies to put it in a box it's well worth it okay. and then you can digitize those letters and print them out if you want and pass them around yeah that's that's a great thing about the the time that we live in. It's so easy to digitize things and then share that digital file rather than having everyone handling that paper. That right. Being handled does not make paper happy. No, and even in a sheet protector, they get they do get handled, mm -hmm. you know? And the sheet protectors uh, are a little plastic sandwich, remember? Yeah. So it's not always the best, um, the best solution. Yeah. What What I've noticed... And I had this happen. Fortunately, it wasn't any um, it wasn't any family papers. It was just my old old genealogy notes that I had. Uh, I had three hole punched them and put them in a three ring binder. And it was one of my old binders that I hadn't looked at in ages. Came across it not too long ago, and there wasn't enough paper to really fill out the binder. Mm -hmm. And the paper, since they weren't supported, they had all started to kind of curl up a little bit. And I, I think that, that we would see the same thing, putting letters in the sheet protectors and then putting them in a three-ring binder, which I've seen a lot of people do at libraries. Hey, you will. They'll, they'll sort of slump. Yeah. And you see that in these boxes, too. If you only have a few items in a box, they'll, they'll just slump. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's important to put something in there to support it and keep them upright and tight. Sometimes I use a crumpled piece of acid-free tissue, or um, if it's a lot of room, I might fold up, uh, fold up a piece of, uh, of acid-free tag board, you know, kind of accordion style, and stick it in the box. Just something to put in the front to keep those, those file folders nice uh, and right. straight. Right. That's a right. great tip, Denise. Yeah. Well, Denise, you've given us so much to think about. I really appreciate you taking the time to share your expertise. And everyone, make sure that you go over and check out Denise's blog at thefamilycurator.com. Thanks. Thanks for joining me, and we'll catch you around later. Okay. Happy archiving. Yeah, happy archiving. Take care. Thanks.